leader. A justice biblical leader is a person who met God in a very personal way. In the presence of God, was able to see himself or herself as God sees. And when you see yourself as God sees, you see yourself as a Then you experience the forgiving, loving grace of God. And then God showed you society out there as God himself sees it. Not situation morality, not the way you want it to be, but a leader sees society as God sees it. That becomes for that leader a vision and a burden. And then that leader spends the rest of his life with a clear vision and a burden. Now that's a leader. There was a leadership crisis in Isaiah's day. The good king had just died. He went into the temple. And instead of seeing the king on the throne, he saw God above the throne. Right away he said, woe is me. He was able to see himself. I'm undone. I live in the midst of an unclean people. My eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Remember the story, how the angel goes to the altar, takes the coals from off the altar, purges his tongue, and he hears another voice that says, your sins have been forgiven. And then the voice says, who will go for me? And Isaiah says, here am I. Dear Lord, a leader is a person that meets God in a very personal way. In the presence of God, is able to see himself and herself as God sees you. Experience the forgiven, loving grace of God. And then God shows that person out there in society as God himself sees it. You see, we don't see what is right in our own eyes. We don't try to make it like we want to be. God wants us to see. He said he doesn't have an eye. To see, let him see. And he wants us to have his eye and to see society. And then spend the rest of his life with that clear vision and a burden. That's why they call the Old Testament prophet the seal. He had met God. And he got a vision from God. And they get the rest of their life with a clear vision. That's a leader. We want to look just for a few minutes at it. A justice leader. We're going to use him as our profile and our model. And what I'm going to look at here now, the ingredients that produce Moses are the ingredients that we got to work on in the community if we're going to raise up indigenous leaders. That's our task. That's our task is disciple making. And making disciples with integrity. I always say we have we we have over evangelized the world too lightly. We are seeing the failure of this life charismatic movement. We are seeing these leaders going to jail and ripped off. You got ripping off society. We over evangelize the world too light. We didn't develop leaders with integrity. And so the whole idea is to make disciples. To make disciples, make leaders that have a sense of integrity and justice. That's our task, is to make disciples. Go into all the world and disciple the nation. That's our task. Develop a health center, gym, and all of those things are only means to the end. And the end is to make disciples. That's our work. All these other things are byproducts. These are aims. But the product is to make disciples. And to make disciples with integrity. Make disciples with that character. Let's take a look then at Moses. When we use Moses as an example of a disciple with integrity, once you use Moses, you don't have an excuse. Because you have to remember that Moses was born in slavery. He was born with a death sentence on his head. And Moses come to be the greatest leader outside of Jesus Christ himself. John said the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. <coughs> now we need to look at the seven ingredients that went into Moses' life. The big question in leadership development is whether or not leaders are born or made. But leaders, biblical leaders, emerge. They appear. They appear out of a situation. And it's the situation that produces them. In the Old Testament, 
Testament, you write the Old Testament, you watch it. Leaders appear. They come out of nowhere. When you meet out, when you when you meet Elijah, you meet him in the scripture. You meet Elisha. You meet Amos. Leaders appear. They emerge. So let's look at the ingredients that went into Moses' life. And these are the seven ingredients that we must put back into our community if we're going to see these leaders emerge that's going to lead us to justice. Look at the first thing it says about Moses. It says, by faith when Moses was born, but he had three months by his parents. The great crisis we face today, the big crisis, is the breakup of the family. The family is God's first phase of morality. The whole creation is modeled after family. The whole concept of God being a father and Jesus being a son is the family. See, that's why community development. We've got to put the family back together, but we've got to put family back together in community. God created mankind to live in community. To love his neighbor as he loves his family. So the family. The family is the first base. We've got to redevelop the family. The church has got to become that extended family to mold these families back together in society. The families are not here to serve the church. The church is here to serve the family because the family is the basis of morality. Moses came from a family. From a family. Until we can produce some young black males in the community, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. And so we need to give special attention to mold the young men in our community so they can become heads of families and restore the family in society. So all the ministry should be looking at how we raise up those male leaders in the community that has integrity that can lead their family. Now, I personally believe in the total equality of humanity. Male and female. I personally think it takes male and female to make the humanity. Amen. So I don't think there's such a thing as superior or inferior. <laughs> male and female may be them, and that constituted Adam. That constituted humanity. And so the family is, cannot be defined the way that people are trying to define it in San Francisco. <laughs> He was hid 
three months by his parents because they saw that he was a beautiful child. Moses came from a family that had a sense of purpose. This word beautiful here, they saw that Moses was born for some noble purpose in life. The reason they say Moses, when they looked at that little baby, they could see that God had given them this child something special. And they raised Moses with a sense of purpose. See, we're going to overcome the drugs, problem. Because young folks are both hopeless and purposeless in survival. And so they're filling their lives up with something they hope will give them meaningful living. Homicide and suicide is the greatest cause of death among young blacks in the ghetto of our nation because life don't have any meaning, don't have any purpose. We got to bring a sense of purpose back to the community. The family got to deal that way. The family has got to affirm the child and let the child know they are value and worth. The big problem today is that we don't have air steam. We don't have air steam. We've lost the sense of purpose in life. And so most of the lives with the sense of purpose. Number four, it said he chose brother. And they were afraid, and they were not afraid of the king's command. Moses came from a family of, of courage. We got to help the young folks develop courage. We got to help them develop the courage of their condition. That's why we got to create young folks high school. We, we got to push them to the limit. We got to help them to do athletics. We got to help deal with in them courage of that condition. Moses came from a family of courage. And, and so what we got to do is build this within the family. All of these ingredients are anchored within the family. And so Moses came from a family of courage. Now courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is the ability to move forward in the face of fear. So without fear, there can be no courage. And so courage is that ability to move on and to do the right thing anyway. The big problem they say in school is what kids go, they call it peer pressure. Peer pressure. The other side of peer pressure is courage. Help your kids to get some conviction. Help them to get a sense of determination. And then nurture that conviction around that determination and what you have is courage. Move forward. And so the fall of the church. Number five, he said, by faith, the mold of a common age refused to be called son of Pharaoh's daughter. Moses had a sense of identity. That's important. It's important that we help people to have a good, healthy sense of to have a sense of their own history, their own background, to have a sense of family, uh, to create a positive environment and to tell your kids that they're like other members of your family, mm -hmm. that uncle, that aunt, so they can have a sense of continuance. They don't feel lost. When you don't have a sense of heritage, you feel lost. But we got generations of people out there who are lost don't have a sense of identity in life. So there's a good sense of identity. I won't forget that uh, they had six people to come to the White House and, and to and talk to the religious community about what the church ought to be about in terms of uh, its work in the country. The National Association of Evangelicals asked me to speak for the evangelicals. They asked uh, Father Ritter to speak for the Catholics. Yeah. Had the Mormon church to speak for the 
Mono and Relief Development to speak for the Mono Church. They had different leaders that represented the national organization in this country. And they asked me to speak for the evangelicals. Of course, I talked to them about leadership development. And I talked to them about the three hours of development. Because I talked to them about the three hours of development. The vice president and all these people down there met me at the door. And they was all shaking my hand. I went to get the Chuck Colson came in there and people was talking about what I said about that. I said, look, I'm only saying this because I have a sense of identity. The people who ought to have been here speaking was Martin Luther King and Matthew X and all those guys that did it. I'm speaking for them. I'm speaking because I know where I came from. Well, they were trying to get me to see that I was something special and great. I knew why I was there. I was there because I was black. I had a sense of identity. You got to know yourself. You got to know why you're there. You got to never lose your identity in life. So there's a need for identity. Moses had a sense of identity. When he met his wife, she thought he was Egyptian, but he knew he was an Israelite. He had a sense of identity. Number six. Number six. He chose brother to suffer affliction with the people of God. We got to restore suffering back to the community as a virgin. That's the weakness today in the wonderful charismatic movement. The weakness in the charismatic movement. They have substituted healing for perseverance and suffering. And to push that father, you're going to end up with health and wealth and prosperity. Because that's the other side of suffering. God calls us to suffer. It is not only given that we should live on Bible, but we should also suffer for his name. The apostle Paul lived his life like that he was filling up in his suffering.
gives the impression that he's going someplace. The leader has vision. So the leader must learn how to be alone with God. Number two, a leader must know how to plan. Leaders must know how to plan, and people must be motivated by their plan. Uh, the plan must be that which wakes you up in the morning. You must live a plan, and you must keep a plan. And you can't become a slave to your plan. You got to have alternative plans, but you got to always live with a plan. With a plan. You got to know what you're going to do. The leader got to know what he's doing. So you got to learn how to plan and to work your plan. And the last one is a leader must learn how to live with pain. Because the leader must enter in to all the suffering of the people that they're leading. And there's always people in the leader's environment that are always suffering, dying, going to the hospital. And the leader must enter that pain with them. And so the leader learns how to live in constant pain. Learn how to get their joy out of suffering. Those are the seven, seven, I gave you seven ingredients and two things have to lead. So what we need is read the leaders that can lead us to justice. Now this movement is going to we got to keep our eyes on Jesus and understand the fact that what Jesus has got us looking at is justice in society. And we've got to understand that justice is eternal vision and that we got to have the stability to move out. Well, let me conclude here. I would just like to, as um, Wayne talked about his wife, and I would like to just say a word about my wife.
young people. And I want to spend my time with these new ministries out there. When these new ministries are developing, I want to be out there and spend my time out there. With the other folks doing the administration and the other folks doing the Wow. Uh-huh. 